Jeff, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you all very, very much. Sorry about that. Find something new every week and what I tried didn't work this morning here. I'm still, I'm at the church this morning trying to see if we can, I can hook all this up to make this work for everybody in the morning. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. It's May 20th, 2022. Our agenda this morning, we'll start with success stories. I do know of one landing. We'll then go to our 30 second introductions. We'll have uh, then our committee reports, workshop, job fairs, practice interview team, the pit crew and the career tip of the week. And then we will go to our main event. Uh, for those people on Zoom, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please just open up the Zoom chat window, put your questions in there. Uh, also, if you'd like to go ahead and start networking, you're welcome to put your contact information in there so we can all uh, find you and, and be in contact with you, which we'll ask for in just a little, couple minutes here. Those on Facebook, we are monitoring that feed and if we have any questions, we'll be sure to get those, uh, we'll get those answers for you. Please note this event is being recorded and is currently live on Facebook. The recording will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel for others to view in the future. By participating in this event, you give consent for your name and your picture to appear. Please note that any comments you put in the Zoom chat window will not appear in the recording. In the recording, excuse me. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jeff Morris. Since 2007, I've been facilitating and leading the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. The group's been around since the late 1990s. Uh, for the last two years, we've been meeting exclusive, exclusively on Zoom, and hopefully in the next week or two, we'll start meeting back in person for those who'd like to come meet in person. In 2008, uh, I started a website called careerdfw.org, a website to help those who are unemployed in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. In 2012, I launched a second website, careerusa.org, to help those uh, around the United States. I have written a book called What I've Learned About Your Job Search that you may not know. It is available on Amazon. And since 2017, I've been a member of the practice interview team, and you'll hear more about that in just a moment. Well, we like to start the meeting off with good news and we have a success story to hear from this morning. So uh, good morning, Kathy, please tell us your good news. Good morning, I landed and I will be starting at Christus Health as a project manager. And so I am really excited about that. So my story is a little unconventional in that I applied for a similar position back in February. And it came, I believe I was down to I made it to the final two or three candidates. And um, so I wasn't selected. However, I did send each of the four people I interviewed with, I sent them a thank you email and just saying, even though I wasn't selected, I wish them well on their future 2022 projects and um, just try to um, generate some positive closure on that. So fast forward to May, I went out and checked the site again and saw that there were five new positions. So I went ahead and applied for them directly. And this was on a Friday. So the following Tuesday, I believe, I received a call from the internal recruiter and she said, uh, hey, one of the hiring managers saw your resume come through and would like to interview to you tomorrow. Are you available? And so I said, absolutely. And so it ended up being the same hiring manager that I interviewed with back in February. So we had a brief conversation and he made me an offer and I am very, very excited and very grateful. So my takeaway from this is um, just always send a thank you note, even if you don't um, end up being the candidate chosen, because you never know if that will generate in a future job offer, because um, the hiring manager will remember you. So thank you to everyone who's a part of this meeting, because I've attended regularly, taken notes, and strive to apply everything that I've learned. So I'm very grateful to everyone. Thank you. Well, congratulations. Thank you very, very much. So if you could tell us what would be the one or two tips in your job search that you think did it? 
I mean, you know, what, what would be the one or two tips that you'd want to share to make, tell everybody to make sure that's what they do in their jobs? Are? Um, absolutely network. And I strived to uh, network as much as I could throughout my uh, months of searching. This original position came to me in February because somebody reached out to me and wanted to know if I was interested. So, so in a way that's, um, through networking. And um, so the LinkedIn profile is, is very important. So make sure that, you know, you keep that current. And also as Terry Sullivan recommends, you know, post regularly and um, continue to add connections. And a gentleman at South Lake yesterday, he had a pretty extensive set of tips that um, helped him generate a role as well. And they're pretty much all tied to our weekly sessions on LinkedIn, on interviewing, on resumes. So all of those recommendations combined together um, are super helpful. The biggest thing that I learned is just uh, be persistent and keep going because it it's stressful and it can be discouraging at times, but Every single person in this group will land because I landed and I, I am just absolutely confident that every single one of you who are still looking for a position, you will land as well. Well, Kathy, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, being with us this morning. I know there are other things you probably could have done, but thanks for coming and sharing your great news. We always like to hear it. Uh, for those who are, if you're not aware, Kathy will be our 18th landing this year from the group that I'm aware of. So, uh, you know, congratulations and hopefully we'll have many more here before the end of the year for everybody else who's on the call today. So, Kathy, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Do we have any other landings? Any other good news to share? Going once, going twice? Oh, Kathy, we have a question. Lily would like to know how long were you out of work? I was out of work 11 months. 11 months, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And may we never see you again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I do want you to know that I did buy some Krispy Kreme donuts. I just couldn't take it any longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Krispy Kreme by me, I think, closed down. So I don't, I'm, I'm out of donuts for a while. Okay, uh, let's move on here. We'd like everybody now, if you can, please, uh, put your 30 second reductions in the Zoom chat window. Uh, open up the chat window or on the Facebook comment field, put in your name, comma, phone number, comma, email address, comma, position you're looking for, comma, and two or three target companies. And then the whole key to this is I will put this out into an email this afternoon. You will uh, get this and hopefully look over the list, see who else do you know, who else uh, you go, oh, I recognize somebody. That, I know somebody at that company. How can you help somebody? So uh, please put that information in. I also use that to update the roster. So if you don't put your name, email address and stuff in the uh, chat window, I will not know you were with us today. For those watching on Facebook, uh, if you put your stuff in the comment field, I will copy, I will copy that information over and then delete it so it's not hanging out on Facebook forever and ever. But we would like to know if you're with us today. So uh, let's put 30 seconds on the clock and we'll have everybody start putting your information in, please. Oops, you get to hear the last boom pump. All right, sorry about that. Let's see here. There we go. All right. Uh, and please, if you're uh, in the middle of doing it, please continue on. Please uh, get your information in there so we can try to help everybody who's on the call today. All right, it's time to hear about job, career fairs, training, and workshops going on. Good morning, Eldon. Good morning, Jeff, and good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. As Jeff said, my name is Eldon Zarinsky, and I'm here to provide you with information on career and job fairs and special workshops or events in the upcoming week. 
Um, the information that I'm about to share comes from the calendar tab on the website Career DFW, which is up on the screen in front of you. Each one of those different colors represents meetings of different types and different topics. Uh, I urge you to go check out the website and find out all the information that's going on in the DFW area that's related to your job search that I'm sure you'll find very informative and important. I go through these items fairly quickly, so if you hear something that catches your ear, I urge you to go to the calendar, click on the item, and there you'll usually find more written information and or links that allow you to register and or participate. Having said that, this week's career and job fairs, uh, this is one of those times where we came up with nothing scheduled for this period, unfortunately. It must uh, be the week before Memorial Day. I think everybody's it is, week, it is the week before Memorial Day, and you know, a lot of people are starting the vacation season, at least I hope they are. Uh, this week's special workshops or events, uh, learn how to use Microsoft PowerPoint 2016. This is the third day of a, of a three-day class uh, that'll be Friday, May 20th from 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Uh, this is a PowerPoint class taught by Philip Konecki, mm -hmm. who's a trainer and career coach, and this is sponsored by Jewish Family Services, and there is a Zoom link to participate in that event. I assume you, know, you probably needed to do all three, but Assuming you've registered for that, today is the last day of that class. Next week, however, learn how to use Microsoft Excel Advanced, a virtual four-day course starting Monday, May 23rd, will be held Tuesday, May 24th, Wednesday, May 25th, and Thursday, May 26th from noon to 1.30 p.m. There's a Zoom link to participate in, in this and register for the class. It's offered by Jewish Family Services and again being taught by Philip Konecki, who's a local tra trainer and career coach. Online, LinkedIn Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Join Locke Alderson, Terry Sullivan, Ruth Lipsky, Kurt Vonnemutter, or our own Jeff Morris each week for an online session about LinkedIn. This week's session will, will be presented by Kurt Vonnemutter. There's a Zoom link and a, and a Facebook link to participate in that event. Uh, there's a workshop coming up on whether or not you know someone in career transition. If you do, I recommend you attend this event. It will be held Tuesday, May 24th from 4 p.m. to 530 uh, at the Cyber Group Conference Room at 5420 West Plano Parkway in Plano. Who should attend? Any professional in transition wanting to meet recruiters face-to-face -face and speed up the landing process? There's a link on the website to find out more about that. This event will feature 12 local area recruiters and or hiring managers in the areas of technology, finance, accounting, pharma, supply chain. And the good news is free and even more, there's a bonus. If you attend, you will be eligible to participate in a raffle uh, where you could potentially win one of eight gift cards. And uh, there again, there's a registration link for this. They have uh, about 150 plus job openings in those particular areas. I urge you to participate in that. Online, interviewing Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Again, this is new for 2022. You can observe a practice interview from the practice interview team each Wednesday. And there's a Zoom link, participate in that event. And I'm sure Mark McDonald will have more to say about that in his presentation. And finally, online, there'll be a networking webinar Thursday, May 26th from 1 p.m. to 2.15 p.m. You can join Career DFW and CareerUSA.org on the second and fourth Thursday from 1 p.m. to 2.15 for their networking seminar. They'll have a different speaker each session talking about networking. And there is, again, a Zoom link and a Facebook mm -hmm. link to participate. And that's it for this week. Eldon, thank you very, very much. All right, let's see here. I keep things moving correctly. If you know somebody who's unemployed, somebody recently unemployed, somebody who's been unemployed for a while, Please let them know about Career DFW and Career USA and all the free tools that are out there, the free webinars we put on. In fact, uh, next week we'll be putting on our 500th online workshop since COVID started. So please, uh, you know, let other people know about the valuable resources and the great free resources that are going on. All right, it's time to hear from the practice interview team. Good morning, Mark. Well, good morning, Jeff. And I've got some guys here at my house doing some estimating. Um, so if you hear some noise or I get interrupted, I may have to, oh, there we go. <laughs> Just got interrupted, but hang on, I'll do this and then we'll go. I wanna, I wanna congratulate Kathy. Kathy uh, joined the pit crew in early January and uh, besides looking for a job and practicing herself three times, 
she contributed to 11 other practice interviews where she was the interviewer. So that was a significant volunteer effort on her part. And so congratulations. Now the phone's ringing with an insurance company want to talk to me. All right, so the pit crew, we're all about helping you to, uh, to, about building your confidence and helping you prepare for real interviews. And we give you that opportunity by giving a very realistic experiential practice interview based on a job description that you provide and also your resume and where you are in the process. If you're uh, in the initial stages or towards the final stages, we'll adjust the uh, tenor of the interview to get you prepared for those uh, opportunities. Our kind of tagline is practice early and practice often. So we don't mind if you come back and practice multiple times. And we certainly want for you to practice early in the process. So if you're just in the job search, find a job description that looks good to you. It doesn't even have to be one that you're engaged in and send it in and we'll give you a chance to practice. Those practice interviews take about 45 minutes and then there's 20 to 25 minutes of discussion afterwards. That's all recorded, the interview and the, and the feedback, so you can study it afterwards. And uh, as I mentioned, you can do this more than once whenever you think you need to. And so when you're ready to practice, just send that information in to dallaspitcrew at gmail.com. That's your resume and your job description. We have three time slots available during the week, one on Tuesday evenings, one on Wednesday afternoon, and one on uh, Thursday afternoon. Now next week, so last week I was here, you know, being poor pitiful me, and I'd only had three uh, interviews in two weeks, only had three candidates in two weeks. Well, I'm all booked up for next week, and I'm booking up for the week after that, and so, and that includes an interview Wednesday live uh, interview, so uh, get prepared for that on Wednesday afternoons at one o'clock. We're going to have a real life practice interview and you'll get to see it in real time. So that'll be an opportunity as well. So, but if you're ready, you know, I'm saying this, so you need to get a little prepared now. Things are starting to pick up. I think interviewing and, in, and hiring are picking up. So you might need to schedule your practice interview like a week plus in advance. So go ahead and send your information in and we'll get you scheduled for the first week of June. That's what I'm doing right now, scheduling for the first week of June. So some additional things that the pit crew does, we also offer a one-way practice interview opportunity. Send me an email and I'll send you back some details about how this works. And I give you the questions in advance. Each, you get three minutes to answer each question. So it's, uh, you know, once you engage the tool, it doesn't take a whole lot of time. And then you get some feedback. You'll get to see your video and see how you did. And if you're not happy with that, you can practice again. You know, Pit Crew is all about practicing. So you can practice multiple one-way interviews as well. Just reach out to me at dallaspitcrew at gmail.com. There's my LinkedIn profile. Please include a message when you request a LinkedIn with me. And uh, I won't hesitate to uh, join you to my network. Uh, but if you don't send a message, I uh, don't pay attention to it, okay? I just want to know that we actually met. So the message can be as simple as, we met on North Dallas Career Focus Group. I'd like to join your network. That's it. Uh, but send a message. Otherwise, I'm going to ignore it. And then finally, I coach uh, two, well, two more things. I coach on one question. And that question is, why did you leave your last position? And I have a couple of people queued up that I need to talk to about that. But uh, it takes about an hour. And if, this, if your situation is in any way complicated, uh, let's have a conversation. Because this is an important question that you do you know, answer well, and uh, we'll spend some time understanding your situation and then figuring out how to answer that question for your situation, plus any follow-on questions that may be generated. So reach out to me at the usual place, dallaspitcrew at gmail.com. And by the way, everything we do, the two-way interviews, the one-way interviews, the coaching is absolutely free. So no worries about the cost, we're here to serve people who you know, don't have a cash flow at the moment. And so we make it as cheap as we can, which is zero. All right, very good. And then finally, you know, Kathy landed. I've had two other panelists land uh, in the last month. So I need more volunteers. So if you've been a hiring manager, you have all the prerequisites that's necessary to be a volunteer for the pit crew. And you're going to learn a lot. You're gonna to contribute to other people's success. It's a very satisfying thing to do while you're in job transition. So reach out to me in the usual way via email or phone, and I'll give you some more information how to get involved 
as a volunteer for the pit crew. Thanks, Jeff. Mark, thank you very, very much. All right, let's hear from Walt Glass, the Interview Success Workshop. Good morning, Walt. Oh, good morning, everyone. And congratulations again, Kathy. Fantastic job uh, on your job search. Plus, uh, so much appreciation and genuinely you know, just love for those people like you that help others to, in their job search. You're fantastic. Thank you much. So what do I do? Well, as I, as I uh, left my job after 25 years and uh, had taught leadership development uh, three or four years inside of that career, taught interviewing, behavioral event interviewing, how to hire people. I sat on the other side of the desk and flunked an interview so badly as a candidate that I decided I had to relearn all this process. So I, I did some deep research and looking at things and I said, what are companies really buying? And I came down to three things. So in 2000, I said, we're selling who we are, what we do and how we can help them. Now, when I went to that interview, it was all about, I do. I was prepared to review my complete history and hope that it matched some of the things that you were looking for in the job. But it didn't even really match it that much. So in developing this, I said, what's, what's going on in the world? Well, I put together this workshop that said, how do we do that? Just how do we sell that? Uh, and the importance of practicing it. So practicing, I mean, we practice all the time. Uh, you didn't get a driver's license without practicing. Jeff has been practicing and working down at the church for several weeks now and probably getting all this ready so he can pull this off smoothly when it goes live, uh, when, when he gets everything worked out. So he's practicing. And when you have a presentation to prepare or a client to meet with or a customer, you prepare, you work, you get some things together. Well, we've done a lot of preparation. We've got a resume, we've done LinkedIn, we've done all this stuff, and then we get to the interview and we don't really practice it. We don't do that. And why is that? Well, I think the major reason is fear. Fear of making a mistake in front of others fear of doing something wrong. So I said, well, my environment's gonna be different. I wanna reduce that. I just wanna put a learning hat on ourselves and say, what can we do to improve ourselves? How can we sell these things? And how can we differentiate ourselves in a very positive way from other candidates? So that's what I offer. It's a free workshop. You have to be registered to attend. Look me up on LinkedIn. My about section gives you some more details about the workshop. You're going to get some uh, handouts and a video that goes over everything we talk about. You're going to get a video yourself. Uh, you're going to get an analyzed job description. So you're going to get a lot of stuff that's going to help you now and in the future as jobs aren't lasting as long as we'd like them to these days. So just, just send an email to the uh, Yahoo email address. That QR code on the screen will actually start an email to request registration. Just edit a couple of things in there if you're interested in doing that. Be glad to have you uh, participate. So the whole environment is learning without squirming. Well, that's Friday, it must be a point day. Does interviewing get stuck in your throat and sometimes cause you to choke? Then practice today, get hired with good pay. It'll be over, and that's all she wrote. Thank you very much, Walt. It uh, wouldn't be a Friday without a poem. All right. Okay, time to hear the career tip of the week. Uh, you can see the new tip every Saturday afternoon. A new tip pops up on the Career Diff W and Career USA websites. Rosanna, thank you for being with us and thank you for reading it this week. Not a problem, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. All right, so today's tip of the week is dated uh, May the 15th of 2022, and it covers six ways to clean up your resume and wow hiring managers. And this article is by Katherine Tuggle. So many of us just, just keep adding to our resume over the years rather than paring it down. And after we've been in the workforce a while, it can be a real jumble. Here's how to streamline. Lifestyle guru Marie Kondo has inspired millions of us to clean up our homes and get rid of what's no longer making us happy. Helping many of us enjoy a more streamlined life. But why stop? with an organized sweater drawer. Our resumes may contain things that are definitely not sparking joy for hiring managers. When they scan our accomplishments and when they uh, mean scan, it's literally scan and 
I am a recruiter, so yes, we do scan. 39% of hiring managers said that they spend less than one minute looking at a resume and about and 23% spend less than 30 seconds according to a survey by CareerBuilder. This means that everything on your resume should immediately shout your qualifications from the rooftops. You don't have to have a long, you don't have to, you don't have long to tell them how amazing you are. This is why cutting out the clutter is so essential. Here's how to do that with a resume cleanup that even Kondo herself would approve. First, get rid of laundry lists. Many people are too long-winded on their resumes, says career advisor Allison Cheston. Think about the impact you've made as opposed to the task you've performed. A resume that just rattles off a list of tasks performed is not compelling. Hiring managers would much rather hear that you drove sales increases 40% year over year by creating a new system. Including too much information may also ensure that hiring managers will not pick up the key pieces you want them to obtain. And that is cautioned by Claire Bissett, Bissot, uh, Managing Director of CBiz HR Services, which is a, a human resources outsourcing and consulting agency. Remember, if your resume only gets a quick glance, you don't want them to be bogged down in extraneous details. Next, cut out repetition. Take a very close look at your resume. Do you have words like manage, ad administer, responsible for, etc., repeated multiple times? If so, find new and more creative ways to describe your job, Bissette says. But there's more than one way to be repetitive. You also shouldn't individually list out consecutive jobs at the same company, cautions Elliot Kaplan, former VP of Talent Acquisition at Hearst Magazines, now career coach at coachtheocaptain.com. Coach um, not only does it take up unnecessary space, but someone not looking closely can get the impression that you're a job hopper. You don't want five consecutive one-year gigs at the same place listed individually, for example. You should combine them into one entry that shows your rapid growth and increasing responsibility at the organization. Next, eliminate photos. There's no two ways about it. Photos on resumes are just downright weird. There's something creepy about it and it can give a negative impression. These days, everyone is on LinkedIn, and if someone wants to know what you look like, they can find you there. Just because we live in a modern era where resumes can feature bold designs, but bold design elements doesn't mean the traditional rules about using a photo have changed. Um, not only is a picture useless in evaluating if you're a good fit for a job, it can be distracting. Next, drop anything that screams, I'm still a kid. This means any crazy email addresses that don't simply include your name at your email service provider of choice. And once you're within one month of graduation, you should also dump any .edu email addresses. The same holds true for including the high school you attended, a long list of internships or college GPA. Your 3.7 is not that big of a deal. And in, excuse me, another big one is to eliminate is college clubs, according to um, Basat, who says that they should also be eliminated five years after graduation. The same goes for ancient jobs. No employer needs to know you worked at a restaurant one summer when you were 16. Next, toss anything that's obvious and or boring. This means you should stop including a section for skills like Microsoft Word, Excel, Outlook, et cetera. Everyone knows them. I believe my pet cockapoo knows them as well. Also stop saying anything about references, like references available upon request. Everyone understands that references are part of the job application process and you'll provide them when asked. And guess what? A recruiter does not need your permission to reach out to one of your former employers and ask about you. Also, if you have a section for interests, they must be interesting. Netflix, cooking, travel are not interesting. If you want to include them, you have to be specific. The or of 
uh, the, the aura of also Alfonso Cuaron, instant pot classics or 50 state covered bridge tours. Lastly, scrap words and phrases like results oriented, liaise, team driven, dynamic and proven track record. They don't convey any real insight into your abilities or personality and using them runs the risk of making hiring managers want to yawn. Next, dispense with your long-term goals and desires. Hiring managers don't, do not care about what you want from your career in the long-term. They want to know if you can perform the job and what you're doing to contribute to the company. When people include these things, it actually, it's actually a very self-centered way of writing a resume. With a resume, you're really telling a company what you can do for them. Why take up space with a section that's all about your desires? Lastly, the bottom line. Everyone's resume is different and, that's, and that is as it should be. You have to show off what makes you unique. If you ask 20 different people to look at your resume, you're going to get 20 different viewpoints. Your resume doesn't need to fit some cookie cutter mold. You should always be looking for ways to distinguish yourself. And speaking of distinguishing yourself, remember that your resume should never be a one size fits all jobs document. Smart candidates retailer their resumes for every position they apply for, boosting certain keywords or skills or highlighting certain experiences over others depending upon the job. Your resume is never one and done. It's a living, breathing document that grows along with you. So have a fantastic weekend, everybody, because that was the career tip of the week for this week. Rosanna, thank you very, very much. All right, coming up in just a couple of minutes, we'll hear from Jeff Trilly talking about free publicity, his story, how he uh, got himself uh, here to Dallas and all the things he did. So it's a really great motivational story to hear that in just a second. Uh, upcoming sessions next Friday, Don Neblon will be with us to talk about personal branding. And then the first Friday of June, as we do the first Friday of every month, we will have open forum. Okay, it's time for our main event, it's time for our speaker. Uh, Jeff Crilly is the CEO of Real News Public Relations and Real News Studios. I've known Jeff for, uh, it's gotta be 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, I don't know. It's been quite a while uh, and uh, Jeff, when I first met him, he was out, oh, let me put this where you can see it, he was out pushing his book, Free Publicity, a great little book, a great little handout that, uh, book that you know, he, he brought to many of us uh, in years past. And so, Jeff, thank you for being with us, and uh, I look forward to hearing your story. I am so thrilled. This is, uh, this is something I look forward to every single year. We've done this now probably every year for 10 years, haven't we? It's been, yeah, I, I should have gone back and looked, but uh, I didn't. It's been a while. Well, um, I think one of the reasons why Jeff keeps inviting me back is that um, my story is a story of tenacity. And anybody who's looking for a job, I think you just got to get super hungry, as Les Brown would say. You've got to get hungry. So uh, my story begins in Detroit. I was a, a, a preacher's kid in downtown Detroit, and uh, my father became the voice and face of the homeless uh, issue in Detroit. And so every year I would grow up around these uh, TV reporters in, in uh, Detroit who were you know, local household names. I mean, think this is the Ron Burgundy years of, of TV news where everybody watched the news and the local uh, anchors were as big as the quarterback of the NFL team. And so I watched these you know, big anchor people and reporters interviewing my dad. And I thought, man, that's pretty cool. That's what I want to do when I grow up. So I went to Michigan State University. Uh, I've got some AV for you. So uh, I went to Michigan State University and my first job in broadcasting was at a little radio station. I don't know if you can see this. So that's me, uh, freshman year. I was in an inner, inner dorm radio station. And this is such a bad radio station. Nobody could hear it. I promise you, nobody heard it. Why? Because it didn't broadcast to the outside world. You couldn't hear it in the car. <laughs> you could only hear it in the dorm, but you couldn't even hear it in the dorm because it was static running through the lines. They didn't uh, 
pay enough money to have a, a decent signal. So nobody heard it. It was good practice. And then I learned that there was a little uh, public access television station. And so I would get on my little moped and I would I would go over to uh, WELM, which was a public access radio station, and there was no teleprompter. And so what we did is we would um, we would take Associated Press wire copy and we would staple it to a piece of paper, and we would we would read that on the air. The problem with that is Associated Press was writing for newspaper, <laughs> so we would end sentences with "He said." I mean, it's just it was it was it was bad bad television. Then I learned that you could get an internship at the local CBS station. And that was really uh, kind of a turning point in my life. So I came into this little TV station in Lansing, Michigan, as an intern, one of five. And I had it in my mind that I was going to just blow them away. I was going to outwork every other intern. And at the end of the internship, the news director would come up to me and say, Jeff Crilly, we've never had anybody work as hard as you. you have. Would you do us the honor of, get, of, of becoming an employee. That was my dream. You know, we all have a movie that we're running and that was the script I had written. And so I was supposed to work 20 hours a week and college internships, if any of you had one, at, at this school, Michigan State University, you paid for the privilege of working for free. So not only would you not even get minimum wage, you were paying the university for, for school credit to, to basically work for free. So. I was supposed to work 20 hours a week for the credits, but I ended up working 60 hours a week. I was there every single day. I never took a day off. I would scrub toilets in the dorms in the morning because uh, I wanted to pay my own way through school. I didn't want my dad, a minister in Detroit, have to pay my way through college. So I was going to pay my own way. So I would, I would scrub toilets in the dorms, and then I would change clothes. I'd put on my little suit and tie. I'd jump on my moped, and I'd go to work at the local CBS station. And then at at the local CBS station, the job was essentially grunt work. You were supposed to like pour coffee for the anchors and then write down what the other stations led with uh, and then call the local police and sheriffs and say, did anybody die? That was kind of the intern's job. But I noticed an opportunity and they always say, you know, uh, dress for the job that you want, not the job you have. And so I noticed an opportunity that these, these photographers were being sent out on stories without a reporter. It was a lesser story. So it might've been the county fair or something like that. And so I would beg the photographer, I'd say, hey, please let me uh, come along with you. And then I'll ask the questions so you don't have to worry about asking the questions. And they were kind of delighted with that, to be honest with you. Uh, photographers, most of them just wanna shoot the pretty pictures. They don't wanna be the reporter as well. So I'd go out and I would do the interviews and then I'd come back and I would write it up for the anchors. And I remember calling my dad in downtown Detroit saying, hey dad, the story that I just wrote is about to come on. Let me put the the uh, the phone right up to the speaker so you can hear the anchor reading my words. And he was so proud. He always he always uh, praised me. I remember going out on a murder story one time, and I called him in Detroit, and I said, "Dad, I just covered this really cool murder." And he says, "Son, let me just stop you for a second. Um, I understand your enthusiasm, but I don't think you should ever use the word cool and murder in the same sentence. People just won't understand." <laughs> so um, I'm out there, you know beating the streets, working as hard as I can possibly work. And I was surrounded by naysayers. And, and this is a, a meeting pearl. You guys can write this one down. Um, you will hang around people who tell you, no, you can't. Why would you think you could? And sometimes those are people who love you. That could be a family member who is a naysayer. And I think if you really want something, you've got to tune out the negative noise. And I was uh, busting my little butt uh, and I had four other interns telling me I was an idiot. You know, Jeff, what are you thinking? They're not going to give you a job. Nobody's ever gotten a job from an internship in the history of this TV station. Why are you working so hard? Okay, so the 10 the week internship came and went, and the news director never offered me the job. And that was a crisis for me. I was like, wait a minute, the, the script is not going as I have, have written it. Doesn't he know his part? His part is to offer me the job. So I had a crisis because if I left along with the other interns, I, I might never get back into this TV station again. So I hatched this plan and I really don't know how I thought I was gonna get away with it. At some point you get busted with this plan. But my plan was, I just won't tell them that the internship is over. 
I'll just keep coming in day after day, week after week for as long as I can possibly get away with it. So all the other interns had drifted back to school and I was the lone intern. And I think my news director was so busy, frankly, that he didn't really give a lot of thought to why is Jeff still here? Maybe he thought I'm going to a different school with different hours or something like that. Uh, but I'm 15 weeks into a 10 week internship when I got busted. I was walking down the hallway next to the newsroom and the news director, think Lou Grant from the Mary Tyler Moore show, old curmudgeon kind of grumbles under his voice. He says, Jeff, this is an awfully long internship. When is this thing going to be over? And I kind of whispered under my, my breath, it was over five weeks ago. And he turned around and he comes up to me and he says, say that again. I said, it was over five weeks ago. He said, come into my office. And this is the scene in the movie of my life where he calls security because clearly I'm trespassing. <laughs> he, he calls me in and he says, let me get this straight. This internship was over five weeks ago. I said, yes, sir. He says, we're not paying you, right? I said, that's right. You're not even getting college credit at this point, right? I said, yeah. He says, what the hell are you doing here? And I just got emotional. Uh, I, I said, please don't make me leave. And this is the air that I breathe. This is what I get out of bed for every morning. Please don't make me leave. And he could see this hunger and it just demanded to be rewarded. And so he said something that he didn't think he would say. He said, I, uh, I don't have a position for you, Jeff, but I'll make a position. I don't know what we're going to call you. It could be newsroom assistant or executive lackey. I don't know what we're going to call you, but but you're hired. We can only give you minimum wage, which was 235, if any of you guys are old enough to remember what minimum wage was in, in the early 80s. But I was overjoyed because that means I didn't have to clean toilets in the dorms anymore. I could just actually go to work at the, the job that I loved. So uh, I became an, a newsroom assistant and I'm doing most of the same things that I was doing before. And then there was a crisis about, about a month or so into this uh, newsroom assistant position. There was a crisis and the crisis was three of the five reporters we had on staff called in sick. Now we're doing like a noon show, a six o'clock show, an 11 o'clock show and a morning show. And you can't really do those with two reporters. So I came in early, like I always did. And uh, the news director was in a foul mood. He was just grumbling. And uh, I said, what's wrong, boss? He says, um, three of our reporters called in sick. How are we going to put together a newscast? And I smiled real big. And I said, coach, send me in. I know the plays. And he looked at me. He says, no, Crowley, this is not happening. You're not reporting. So he goes into his office. And I could hear him calling these very same reporters that had called in sick. And, and saying things like, how sick are you really? All we got is Krilly, uh, which made me feel really, <laughs> really special, really warm and fuzzy. And he would kind of look out the, uh, the door and I was there waving at him and he was like scowling, no, it's not gonna happen. So he spends about 15 minutes trying to call these people in. And finally he comes out to me with a uh, three quarter inch tape, which is an old style tape. These days they shoot on a chip uh, and he hands me the tape and gives me this ringing endorsement. He says, don't suck. So with that vote of confidence, I went out and I did a story and I showed up for the, you know, the six o'clock news and I'm editing in the edit bay and, and it's about 15 minutes from, from the time the show goes on and news director comes over and looks at the piece that I had put together and he takes a long pause and he looks at me and he says, it doesn't suck. And it made the air. And the next thing you know, I became a reporter at this little TV station. In fact, so this is me. Jeff, you love the AV. That's, that's a young Jeff Crilly in Lansing, Michigan. Um, I got a funny story to tell about this guy. It's funny how you can, you can remember, remember people from now uh, 40 years ago. His name was Elvin Pomnachowski. And, <laughs> and I'm out on the street and I think I'm a big deal because I'm, I'm on the news. And um, Al, Alvin Pomnachowski kept, did this little public, public access uh, late night movie review show in which he dressed up. Uh, anyway, it was just a funky little show. And I remember we're out on the street one day and this guy walks over towards us and says, aren't you? And I got ready to say, yes, I'm Jeff Crilly. And he says, Alvin Pomnachowski? <laughs> so, TV will teach you humility. 
So I, uh, I started working my way up and the next thing you know, I was a weekend anchor. So that's me, a weekend anchor boy at Channel 6. Um, and uh, I, I always felt bad because I was so young. I was 20 years old and I thought to myself, how am I, you know, I don't even, I'm in a, an apartment. I don't know anything about life. And here I am telling all of Lansing, Michigan, the news and, and half of the stuff I was reading, I don't think I completely understood. Uh, but it was cool because we, we were the CBS station and the number one uh, show uh, in the country was 60 Minutes. So even if you didn't watch the news uh, during uh, 60 Minutes, you would see me pop up on the screen and it was this little chubby faced anchor boy saying, murder in Lansing details at 11. And so uh, college kids started to recognize me. My professors were recognizing me. Uh, I remember one of my favorite stories from college was I was taking criminology and our final exam was basically uh, do, a, uh, do an essay on the crime of your choosing. And uh, I had just finished a five part series on prostitution in in Lansing, Michigan. And rather than writing the essay, I came up to the professor and I said, hey, I just did a five part series on this for TV. Is it okay if I just handed my scripts? And he said, that, well, that's a first. <laughs> so uh, I presented, my essay was a, uh, a VHS tape and a, and a script from television. So then I, I got to the point where I was ready to leave Lansing, Michigan. I was ready to move on in my career. And I uh, started sending tapes out all over the country. And I got picked up by a station in Omaha. Now, uh, I don't know if anybody has been to Omaha. Uh, there's not a lot going on in Nebraska. It's pretty much uh, wide open plains. In fact, uh, I covered the unicamera, which was the state legislature. They only had one house. It was, everybody was a senator. They, they didn't have two houses. And I remember that for real, there was a bill that was introduced to raise the speed limit to 75 miles an hour from 60 or something like that. And then another senator introduced a bill kind of tongue in cheek to lower the speed limit to 35 miles an hour, just so people would have to spend more time in Nebraska on their way to <laughs> Colorado or something like that, right? So um, the, the best thing that happened when I was in Lansing uh, or in, um, in Omaha was uh, a guy named Mike McKnight came into my life. And uh, can I share my screen, Jeff? Uh, yeah, there we go. You, got, you gave me access. So um, I want to show you what Mike McKnight looks like because believe it or not, Mike McKnight is still on the air all these years later. But Mike McKnight taught me something. Uh, let me find him here. I'll just put him into uh, YouTube. Isn't that crazy? So this guy, uh, I think it was Katie, uh, Omaha. See if I can find him. I won't take up too much more class time with this. Uh, yeah, there's there's Mike McKnight. I'm gonna um, I'll pop this down so you don't have to hear him. Anyway, um, Mike McKnight was a legendary reporter in Omaha. He was, uh, you know, famously out with cops at a bachelor party, and uh, all of a sudden, all the cops' beepers go off, and it was a double homicide and he's already out with him at a bachelor party and so he's got the scoop and so I, I really lived in fear of Mike McKnight because uh, I was broadcasting from the Lincoln Bureau for a station in Omaha and the Lincoln Bureau was just me and a photographer and a phone and every day at six uh, the phone would ring and uh, I would, uh, would be the news director from Omaha saying how come Mike McKnight beat you once again and uh, I, I just lived in fear of that phone call because he beat me five nights a week, he was beating me. And so I would uh, the next day make a promise to call, there's Mike. So uh, I would make a promise to myself, I'm just gonna find out where Mike McKnight, like, like a squirrel hides all his acorns. As they all, we all have tricks, right? So I would get beat by Mike. And then the next day I would call the person who gave him the story and I'd say, hey, Jeff Crilly from, from uh, you know, channel three. Uh, I know you know Mike McKnight because uh, I just uh, saw you on his air yesterday. How did Mike get that story? And he would say, well, you know, Mike calls me two or three times a week. And I said, well, if it's okay with you, I'd like to call you four or five times a week. <laughs> so, so I started beating Mike McKnight on his own 
turf and there's another meeting pearl here, don't be afraid of good competition. Uh, I learned more about reporting by getting my butt kicked than anything I learned in Lansing. And at a certain point, I felt like I was good enough to move on to the next market. In fact, I do have a really cool picture to show you. This is me and, and H, H. W. Bush. Um, this is when he wasn't—he wasn't even president yet. He was—he um, was vice president under Reagan, and he was running. And he was coming through Omaha, and I had a chance to interview him for uh, three minutes. They lined up all the TV stations, and we each got three minutes with him. And my memory of him is he was just very kind to me. And at the time, I thought he was just being a, you know, a slick politician. But he would like shake my hand. He'd say, my name is George. And I'm like, I, I, know, I know who you are, Mr. Vice President. And he would say, what's your name? And I said, Jeff. He said, thank you. So for the three minutes that I was interviewing him, I was Jeff. And he says, that's a great question, Jeff. And I was kind of enamored with that. And I, I always charted it away as just uh, he was being a smooth politician. But then when he passed a few years ago, we started hearing stories from his Secret Service agents that, you know, he, he knew all their uh, you know, kids' names. And I think he was just a really good man who cared about people. So that was, uh, that was Omaha. And then I got a job in Minnesota. And the, the thing about Minnesota is it's very, very cold. <laughs> I grew up in Detroit and I knew what cold was, but you know, you would wake up in Minnesota and there was, there was a weather guy saying, we're expecting a high today of 16 degrees below zero. Uh, and I'm like, wait a minute, you're kidding me. It's not even gonna crack zero. This is too cold. I, would, I had electric hunting socks. If anybody knows what that is, you, you have a little battery and there's a coil that wraps around your, your toe to keep your feet from freezing. Um, Minnesota was the 13th largest market, and I did some cool things in Minnesota, uh, did some cool stories. I was continuing to learn, but I also had kids at that point. So my, my daughter comes along. My daughter's name is Sarah. And I remember one time there was a snowstorm uh, in, in Minnesota, and it was uh, Halloween day. And I thought to myself, okay, don't let an opportunity like this go to waste. I, I need to make a, a video resume. So I grabbed my wife and I grabbed my little girl and we went out in the backyard and I made a home video for the news director. I do three different takes because I was trying to move to Dallas from cold Minnesota. And so I would, uh, I would say to the news director at you know, channel five here in Dallas, uh, hey, Dave, Jeff Curley from Minnesota. This is Halloween day. Uh, my wife, Susan's running the camcorder. My daughter, Sarah, she likes to frolic in the snow, but this is no way to live life. She's gonna be trick-or-treating tonight in two feet of snow. Please save me. And I joked that I taught my daughter to say, please hire my daddy. She was actually too young to learn those words, <laughs> but that would have been a good one if I could. So I would send these tapes to, to uh, Dallas and uh, I would do it every single month. Um, the next month, I remember it was you know 20 degrees below zero. So I grabbed my wife and I would be standing in front of a bank marquee that would say 20 degrees below zero. And I'd say, hey, hey, Mike, this is gonna be a short one because it's 20 degrees below zero. Please save me, here's my latest work. And I would show them my latest uh, you know work in, in uh, Minnesota trying to get the job in Dallas. So I did this uh, month after month for a year and a half. Uh, I was just, pestering these people. But I, I remember kind of cloaking it in, um, in positive terms. And I think you can get aggressive in the job hunt as long as you don't look like a stalker. So what I remember one of my tapes, I said, hey, Mike, I'm going to keep sending these to you month after month, year after year, until you either get a restraining order against me, or you break down and you hire me. But I believe that you want aggressive reporters, and I'm not, I'm not going to give up on you just the same way I wouldn't give up on a great story if you hired me. Um, I'll see you next month. And so I kept sending these things month after month. And later I learned that they were showing these tapes to their, their uh, employees, the, uh, the reporters in Dallas. They were saying, hey, look, you know, you know how lucky you are? Here's this clown from Minnesota who's, who's exploiting his family trying to get a job. You are so lucky to have this job at Channel 4. Well, after doing this now for uh, 
you know, uh, a year, I was starting to get frustrated. I was like, what more can I do? And then I thought to myself, you know what? It would be nice if I went to the TV station and presented them with a, a history. You know, this is your life channel four. And so at the time I went to the Dallas uh, Public Library and I remember spending $50 on on copies and I would photocopy everything ever written about the three stations. They had a little clipping service. And so you had the channel four file, the channel eight file, the channel um, you know, five file, and I would photocopy everything. And then I would study like it was a final exam. And then I would go to each station and I'd say, you know, I've always wanted to work for channel four because you guys are the news leaders. You know, you, you were the first one with the satellite truck. You were the first one with the helicopter. And then I would say the same thing at the other two stations. I, I've always wanted to work with you because you were dominated the Delta plane crash. And, you know, I just told them what they wanted to hear. But this comes to a, uh, an important point about what I consider the best job interview I ever did. The best job interview I ever did was at Channel 5. I ended up becoming a reporter at Channel 4. But to this day, I still believe it, it was the best job interview I ever did. While I was in the hotel room studying like a final exam about the three stations, I read this article about Dale Hansen get from channel eight getting the peabody award for the smu player scandal the one that got them the death penalty and in many respects smu's football team has never fully recovered from that that dale hansen story and the death penalty but why i'm telling you this story is as i'm reading this article about dale hansen winning, winning the peabody i remember uh reading a name uh, John Sparks was his name, and he was the producer for Dale Hansen, which means he did most of the work, and then Dale comes in and does the gotcha with the uh, SMU athletic director. And so as I'm pestering the three stations, I would, I would fly down on my own dime. I'd stay in a hotel with my wife and young daughter, and I made it a promise. I want to get in to see every single news director in town, all three. Uh, Channel 11 hadn't really come along yet. It was an independent station. So I, uh, what I would do is I'd call the secretary. I'd call the secretary to the news director. I'd say, hey, it, Christy, it's Jeff Crilly from Minnesota. She says, I know you called yesterday. I said, oh, yes, I'm sorry for that. I, um, I'm just wondering if Mike has a couple of minutes. I mean, I could show up with a, you know, a, a coffee and donuts in the lobby. I'll just need two minutes with him. No, I'm so sorry, Jeff. He's too busy today. And then I said, all right, I'll call you tomorrow. And I would call the secretary the next day and charm her. And you, know, you can hear a smile on the phone. I remember saying, Christy, have I ever told you how much I admire and appreciate you? And she could hear the thick sarcasm, but the smile came through on the phone. And she said, all right, Krilly, I know you're trying to get in to see Mike. All right, I'll give you three minutes with Mike in the lobby, but you got to promise me you're out in three minutes. And I would say, thank you, Christy. I'm going to name my next child Christy, I promise. So uh, I would, you know, go to the news director and, um, and, and, and visit with them. But uh, I... The trip had ended. It was the last day of the trip, and I could not get in to see uh, the news director for Channel 5. And that was frustrating for me because I considered it a hat trick. I had to get into 4, 5, and, uh, and 8, or else it was a failed trip. And the news director from Channel 5 was too busy. So I did what I considered the most bold thing that a job candidate can do. After being told, no, he can't see you, I showed up. <laughs> I showed up in the lobby and I was very polite and very respectful and I brought a big book and I said to the secretary or the receptionist, I said, my name is Jeff Crilly. I'm a reporter candidate from Minnesota. My plane does not leave until five this evening. And uh, I know uh, Dave Overton is very, very busy. Uh, but uh, if it's okay with you, I'd love to just kind of sit in the lobby here reading my, my book. And if Dave Overton happens to walk out, would you point him out to me? I have no, way, no idea what he looks like. And I, I, you know, I'd be eternally grateful if you would do me that kindness. And I think the, the receptionist simply didn't want me cluttering up her lobby. So she called back to Dave Overton at Channel 5 and she said, look, there's this guy from Minnesota. He says, I know who you're talking about. All right, let him in. So I go back there. And I'm meeting Dave Overton for the first time. And he was a genuinely nice guy. He says, Jeff, I, I, I've been you before. I've wanted a job so bad I can taste it. I seriously don't have time to talk to you today. Let me introduce you to my number two guy. His name is John Sparks. And I look at John Sparks and I think, where do I know that name, John Sparks, John? And I shake his hand. I said, not the same John Sparks who won the Peabody Award for the SMU Players Scandal. 
And he smiled a big smile. He says, why, yes, I am, son. Come into my office. And I spent 45 minutes in his office talking about him, talking about uh, you know, how amazing that was, talking about his career. And then the last five minutes, he asked me a couple of questions about myself. But there's another meeting, Pearl, write this one down. I think most of us uh, do job interviews the wrong way. Uh, we're not talking about their favorite subject. Their favorite subject is themselves. Your favorite subject is yourself. So um, rather than impressing them with all your awards and all of the wonderful things that you've done in your life, I think you should spend the first few minutes, uh, longer if possible, telling them, you know, the reason I want to work for company XYZ is I went on LinkedIn and I saw your career history. And I saw that you won this award when you were at this company. I saw you won this award. I saw that you turned the company around. Employee retention has gone up. Um, tell me how you do this. What is your business philosophy? How are you able to do this? And get the person talking about themselves long enough. And what happens is they, they essentially make a bunch of decisions about you. While they're talking about themselves, they're saying, okay, this person asks good questions. They clearly do their homework. I like them. Is this a person that I wouldn't mind seeing every day? And so they're making all of these wonderful judgments. And then they look at your resume and then they are pleasantly surprised that you're actually qualified for the job. So um, the reason I say this is the best interview I ever did is I got back on that plane from Minnesota. And by the time I got back to Minnesota, I had um, uh, three of my references say, I think you're about to get the job at Channel 5. Uh, John Sparks called and I raved about you, Krilly. I think you're going to get the job at Channel 5. Well, as fate would have it, I ended up getting the job at Channel 4 first. And when I got the job at Channel 4, I asked the news director, I said, hey, when did you make up your mind that you were going to hire me? He says, about six months ago. <laughs> I said, it would have been nice if you told me that. I mean, here I am exploiting my family. And, and he says, no, no, I, I knew. I, I knew I was going to hire you. I just didn't have an opening for you. And, and so welcome aboard. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about Channel 4. Channel 4 was a wonderful uh, career. Uh, I did, um, uh, let's see, I'm going to show you me at Channel 4. Uh, Jeff Curley. I can find this now. Not, not all of my stuff is online, but I did find I did find this. So I'll sh I'll show you the first few seconds. Doubles as a watchdog, alerting a Dallas homeowner to a burglary in progress with an email. First at nine, Fox Four News starts now. Good evening. I'm Steve Eager. It's nine o'clock. I'm Heather Hayes. Jeff Curley is first tonight on Fox Four from Northeast Dallas, where a homeowner witnessed his house being burglarized. Jeff. It really is an incredible story. You're watching me right now the way Marshall Hayes, who was in his office at the time, watched a burglar in his home this morning by webcam. And he hopes that this high-tech tool, along with a tip from the public watching right now, will help put this burglar behind bars. Uh, and so that was me. I was kind of, you know, doing crime every night. <laughs> um, a changing point in my life. Uh, and Jeff, how much, I don't want to run out of time. So uh, how much time did you budget for me? Uh, you're good till 11, 11, 11, 15, whatever you need. Cool. Um, I wrote a book in 2002 called Free Publicity that Jeff showed at the top. And if you want to put your uh, email address in the chat, I will send you a free e-copy. I, I, the, the book, uh, I'm self-published, and uh, I used to uh, just give it away. I would buy uh, you know, reprints of the book and, and give it away. But now, um, every time I give the book away, people say, Jeff, is this your son? <laughs> because the, the picture is, is now uh, kind of dated. <laughs> I like to think I still look like that, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably like that realtor who's still using her picture from 1975 on, the, on all her propaganda. Uh, anyway, so I'll send you an ebook if, if you guys uh, send me your, your email address. Uh, so the, the point is, I wrote this book on publicity, and my TV station at the time gave me permission to print the book. Uh, they said, hey, Jeff, how are you planning to promote it? And I said, well, I figure I'll go around and give speeches. And they said, all right, as long as you understand, you're not allowed to accept a speaker's fee. So go around and speak for free to promote your book. So you're looking at a crazy man who gave 300 speeches a year for six straight years in addition to his TV job breakfast speech, lunch speech, go to work at Fox 4, 
breakfast each lunch week, go, go to work at Fox 4. I ended up selling 70,000 copies of a $10 book from the back of the room. And that's how my new career started because I'm signing people's books and they're either complaining about their PR firm or they're saying, I could buy your little do-it-yourself book, but I'm not gonna do it, Jeff. I don't have time to call reporters and follow up with them and send emails. Can I just hire you? And I would say, no, I can't take your, your, your money. I'm on the news and it's unethical for me to uh, take money under the table. I'll just give you free advice. And they'd say, all right, give me some free advice. I said, what are you trying to promote? And then they would tell me and I'd say, well, that's easy. There's a columnist with the Dallas Morning News named Cheryl Hall. She writes for the business section. She would love your story. The story you just told me is a David versus Goliath story. So, you know, call her up, use my name. And I promise you with that story, you're gonna get in the Dallas Morning News. And uh, they would call me up a few days later and they'd say, Curly, you're a genius. Uh, I'm gonna be featured in the Sunday Dallas Morning News. And I would go out in the driveway, I'd pick up the paper and I'd see somebody that I saw that I gave free advice to. And I would say to myself, man, somebody would have made a lot of money off of that. Some PR firm would have made a lot of money off of that. And it wasn't me. So I, uh, I was getting to the age of 45 and I had spent a total of 25 years in the business, Lansing, Omaha, Minneapolis, Dallas. And I wasn't getting any younger. I was doing murders and fires every night. I had done almost everything that I wanted to do on my bucket list in TV news. Uh, I freed an innocent man from prison. I won some Emmy awards and did some cool things. And so I got my wife's permission to quit. Very important for you, those of you who are married, ask your, your, your mate's permission before you do something that drastic. And I quit. And I started this company in my home in 2008, laptop, cell phone, calling myself a PR firm. Uh, I'm going to give you guys real numbers because I want to inspire you in this. Uh, it may, I don't want it to sound braggy. I, I'm transparent because I want you guys to um, hear my heart. I took a big chance. I left a job that was paying me $135,000 a year at Channel 4. I'd probably still be there today had it not been for this leap of faith that I took in May of 2008. Um, I didn't even know what a PR firm charged, so I asked a friend and um, uh, she says, it's all over the map, really in Dallas, it could be two grand a month for a person at home like, like she was calling herself a PR firm, all the way up to the Richards Group, which at that point represented Chick-fil-A, and who knows how many hundreds of thousands of dollars a month they were charging Chick-fil-A. So I arrived at the price of three grand a month. So uh, Clint David is my very first client. He was one of 10 people paying me three grand a month in 2008. Now let's do the math. That's 30 grand a month. So $360,000 a year. And this is year one with no overhead. And I'm not you know, no employees, no rent. It's just me. Second year, I had 20 clients paying me three grand a month. That's 60 grand a month. And I had to start hiring people. In fact, I'm going to walk out on the floor and, and introduce you to employee number one who's still with me today, which is a big source of pride. Because other than my son and my daughter, he's the only one who, who remembers when this the, the address, the corporate headquarters for Real News PR was 3108 Parma Lane, Plano. <laughs> So this is my very first client, and, and I'll kind of explain what we do here at Real News PR. Clint David is a Dallas attorney. Dallas attorney Clint David is attorney Clint David. Lawyer Clinton David says the landmark ruling could have a major impact in Dallas. It completely changes how the, the Corps of Engineers, I believe, is going to do business. So I'm a pleaser. I wake up every morning, uh, and he... Uh, he would praise me. He would say, Jeff Curley, you're a, you're a rock star. You got me on two stations yesterday. You got me on channel eight and channel 11. Man, you're a rock star. What did I do without you? And I wanted to hear that. So I, I said, okay, if I got him on channel eight and channel 11 yesterday, let me get him on channel four and channel five today. So I just watched the local news and I'd see my friend Sean Rabb from channel four at the courthouse covering the Don Hill trial. And I'd call him up and I'd say, hey, Brother Rab, how you doing? He says, well, not much, Brother Curly. Well, how are you doing? How are you liking life after news? Oh, I love life after news. What's up? Hey, I see you're on the Don Hill trial at the federal court building. Uh, do you need a legal opinion? Somebody who's not tied to the case? Yeah, who do you got? Clint David. Oh yeah, the dude with the good hair. We love him. Have him come down to the courthouse and I'll interview your boy. So lather, rinse, repeat. He got really good at talking on the news. And the next thing you know, I'm introducing him to Fox News out of New York. And they're, they're taking a, a shining to him and they decide to uh, uh, make him a regular. So they started to send a town car to his office 
um, and they would take him downtown and he'd talk live to the nation and they would, they'd do this twice a week. So into the first year, he calls me up and says, Jeff, I've got good news and bad news. I said, tell me the good news. He says, dude, you got me 500 media placements last year, 500. It could have been 700, but I had a firm to run. I said, what's the bad news? He says, Jeff, I really don't need you anymore. They call me the rat. And I'm such a pleaser, middle child, son of a minister. My love language is praise. I didn't even hear I got fired. I heard the opposite. I heard you did too good a job and worked yourself out of a job, which a lot of PR firms would never hear. If anything, it's the client saying, I'm paying you. Where's the media? So I said, I want to hear that every day for the rest of my life. And the only way to hear that every day for the rest of my life is to only select clients who I can make deliriously happy with. So there's a lesson here for many of you who um, have their own company or they're working out of the house. Not everybody with a checkbook is your client. So uh, make sure that you're only attracting people that you can make happy and are cool people who give you uh, life instead of drain your life. So how do, uh, how do I get people on the news? I'm gonna show you um, what went out this morning to 27,000 journalists across the country. And there's a lesson in all of this. You're hearing a theme, it's kind of stick to itiveness It's Jeff Curley getting up, working long hours. Even to this day, when I could probably coast, I've got a nice team working for me. I get up every day to create this. This went out to 28,000 journalists. On the right hand side is fun stuff. She works for me. I'm saying to the journalists, if you need help finding an expert, here's Laura. She spent 28 years in news. She would be happy to help you. Uh, blooper of the day, celebrity birthdays, on this day in history, random trivia, viral video of the day, today's World B Day, how much is this rare uh, poster worth, and then the, uh, the weird story of the day. In the middle is how I make my money. People pay me to get them on the news. I decided to leave the price of gas. So this story comes from the NBC in Phoenix, but then I'm giving you a little narrative. I say, this is me writing this. The total rig count rises every single week week linked to another article that talks about how many rigs are, are pumping right now. Uh, why isn't it enough to bring prices down? Linked to another article. It's become a political football. The uh, GOP are blaming Biden. I try to be right down the middle. So I say, how much is, Bi is Biden's fault and how much is simply political rhetoric? Jay Young is a fourth generation oil and gas man. He wrote this book and you're free to call him direct. That is gold. Uh, Journalists hate PR people. I, I, I used to hate them when I was a, a news guy. Why? Most of the time they're in the middle of their clogging up the, the, the works. Uh, second story is, I found this to be interesting, happy heart syndrome. We all know about broken heart syndrome, um, happy heart syndrome. You can get so happy that, that you can have a heart attack. And so she is a client, she's a current ca cardiologist. Uh, it's rare for cardiologists to give out a cell phone. So. I, I think she's gonna have a very busy day. And then this last one is about travel scams um, during the summer. And here's a client who happens to be a, uh, an expert in cybersecurity. You do this every day for 13 years, not missing a single day in 13 years, and it becomes a thing. I now have journalists who don't remember life before my daily offerings. They'll, I'll get an email from the fourth hour of the Today Show, and the subject line will be, Jeff, I miss you. And I'm like, the, the Today Show misses me? And, this, and it would be a producer saying, hey, I was reading you when I was in the small market of Chattanooga. I was reading you again when I got the job at WGN in Chicago. And um, now I'm the senior producer of the fourth hour of the Today Show. So I wanna show you something, and this is meant to inspire you. And there's a meeting pearl after I finish this. This is the open rate of 17% for a daily email is exceedingly high. But you'll be even more impressed when you learn that of the 27,000 journalists on my list, I spammed 26,000. They did not ask to receive this. This I just spammed them, which is reckless. If you, if you, if you spam too many people, they constant contact shuts you down. But the nice thing about this is you actually get to see who's opening it and what they're reading. And that's powerful because it helps me understand. So that's, that's a reporter at, at a station in San Francisco. Um, let me find one that might impress you guys. Uh, you know, the Denver Post, uh, NBC Uni. This could be any NBC in the station in the country. This is the Washington Post. 
Let me see how engaged this person is. Um, 17%, so about one out of five times this person reads me. But the cool thing is uh, I've become a voice in journalism. So I've been able to replicate myself. Instead of having an army of PR people working beneath me, I can sit uh, in, in my man cave every morning and send out an email that I know will cause the phone to ring for my clients. So uh, the meeting pearl is, uh, I call it the power of habit. What are you doing every single day that you can't imagine not doing to further your goals? So if that's, you know, I'm gonna connect with another 15 people on LinkedIn, make it a, an obsession. You're, you're saying to yourself, this between this hour and this hour, I am going to do this thing. And it doesn't matter if I'm sick, it doesn't matter uh, you know, what's happening with the weather, I'm going to do this thing. Um, I promise you, I mean, think about that. I've, in, in 13 years, you know I've been sick. I've had COVID like three times. I'm still putting this thing out every single day for 13 years. This is a Jeff Crilly fan. Watch this. Her engagement rate, 94%. <laughs> Look at how many times she opened me yesterday. Look at that. She, she runs a uh, large conglomerate of stations in Michigan. And when I get guests on her show, it, it goes out across 16 different stations. Um, I want to take, take you on a little tour because this thing that started in my home is now uh, 20 full-time employees. 18 of them are former uh, news people. So we're at Lincoln Center, which is LBJ and the Tollway. You can see we've laid it out like a, like a television newsroom. This is, uh, I told you, employee number one. This is, this is employee number one. If, if we had badges, uh, so Chris. Uh, we got a lot of people on here. We do, we do. Kathy, Kristen, Cart, <laughs> Rosanna, Walt, and Jeff, and other people that I can't see. So uh, when I'm working out of my house, Chris was working out of his home and we're calling ourselves a PR firm and now uh, 20 full-time employees. Uh, the only two who are not journalists are my son and my daughter and they get a hall pass. So this is my son, Dallas. Uh, hey, how's it going? Yeah, so Dallas does not remember Minnesota because he was two weeks old when we left Minnesota for Dallas and everybody kind of joked with me Man, it's a good. Did you name your kid after the market you were going to? Seriously, it's a good job you didn't get a job in Scranton. Um, so anyway, so uh, Dallas knows my story of uh, Minnesota, and uh, he was born in St. Paul. Yep. Hey, pleasure to meet y'all. Yeah. Um, it's good and, to be in Dallas. And Dallas wrote a book. Can you show him? Uh, so yes. it's right there. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so this is a book called Kid from War. I wrote it when I was a kid, uh, which was I was 14 years old. And it's a collection of true stories of kids who started their own businesses before they turned 18. Flip it over so they can see. Yeah, see the that's key. me when I was 14. I was actually living in Michigan. So that's me hanging out on my on my stoop. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. It's great to meet y'all. Yep. Okay. So how cool is that that I get to build something with my son and my daughter? Um, one of the things I should tell you is in the last, in the last uh, four years, something really cool happened. We got into podcasting on steroids. And by podcasting on steroids, I mean television. So we, we started to look at podcasting and we said, how come everybody's at home with a ring light? What if we gave commercial television to podcasters? So I'm in a, I'm in a, a television studio. Uh, it's kind of like the Today Show. People walk down the lobby here. It's a big screen there where if I do a Zoom call and Zoom somebody in, it looks like you're talking to the Wizard of Oz. That's a really big look. Um, and then I'm going to show you what our other studios look like because there may be people on this uh, Zoom who have thought about doing a podcast. There's a lot of good reasons to do a podcast. And I'm going to show you... Um, what our podcast studios look like. I now have 12 studios and I've spent a million and a half dollars on TV studios. They're the nicest studios this side of the Today Show. And this division is in hyper growth right now uh, because most of the shows that we do uh, have a host and have a guest or two or three. And so um, let me skip this ad and you'll see what our studios look like. This first studio that you're going to see is a big anchor desk. Um, it cost me $10,000. You can't go to Home Depot and get an anchor desk. They just don't offer that there. But look at that. 
So when I do my television show on the anchor desk, it, it really does look like the news. Um, this little division grew from about five shows four years ago to now 93 unique shows. Um, this studio we nicknamed Oprah. Uh, you can fit 50 people in there. 50 people clapping look like 500 people clapping. Uh, and it's um, that there's Ted Nugent. So Ted and his wife are clients. They'll drive up from Waco and knock out four shows and then go back home again. Uh, but this little division is now um, really taking off and we, we see this as the future. We've got studios in Dallas. We've got studios in Fort Worth. We've got a studio up at Grandscape, up our Nebraska Furniture Mart. And um, what I love about this part of my journey is now, instead of just lighting one candle, like uh, I was doing in PR, you know, I'm gonna get you on channel four or channel five. I'm now lighting candles that are lighting other candles because the people who I'm giving shows to are off inviting other people on their shows. And so I truly believe the future is not in, please channel eight, tell my story. The future is in tell your own story. And if we do it in a way where we've got very professional studios, um, people really can't tell the difference between the stuff that we're producing and the real news. Um, what would be fun for me to do, Jeff, is to take some Q&A right now. Um, is, can we open up some mics and, and uh, allow me to answer some questions? Yeah, if anybody has a question, you're welcome to uh, unmute your mic and ask away. Now, I do need yeah, to hear the pizza. Me? You do need to tell us a pizza oh, story I... before we're done. So, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. T t say that again. I had you down. You do, you do need to uh, tell us the pizza story before you uh, before yes. you're done. I always like that. Okay. I always okay. like that story. I tell it occasionally. I okay. give you credit. Okay. Any questions anybody has? You're welcome to unmute your mic. Got a number of people in the comment field have said I want a copy of your book. Oh, Rusty, go ahead. Yeah, Jeff, thanks for uh, speaking with us today. Uh, I'm a marketer here, and so I, I'm interested in hearing your perspective on how PR is changing uh, in the digital world. What, what do you think is the direction that PR is going? Well, what I think if you're a marketer, you have to specialize in a niche. And so what we specialize in is getting people on the news. And that's a niche. When we talk about public relations, we're talking about marketing, it's a big umbrella. So some PR firms in Dallas don't really pitch the news. They do events, they do ribbon cuttings, uh, they do galas. And so um, you asked a direct question, how has uh, the media changed? I think what changed is when I was growing up, there were three stations. My dad in Detroit only had to call three stations. Now there's a bazillion stations on your phone and, and the fight is over the rectangle. So how does it get to the rectangle? Most people don't care. Anybody under 30 does not care that it came from ABC News. You know, it could be a 13 year old girl giving makeup tips. So uh, for the purposes of this call, I think the future is in tell your story tell your own stories, tell it in a compelling way. Uh, I would encourage people on this call to use video to tell their story. I'm a big fan of anytime somebody sends me a video on my phone, uh, I watch it and you get so much more information. In fact, I, I'm, I'm reminded that I need to do this more often, but sometimes what I would do is, uh, I, you know, I got a new client and we're talking about the client in, in our newsroom over here. And I say, you know what, hold on for a second. Let's just shoot a little video. And then I do a little video saying, hey, Sally, uh, I hope you're doing well in Kansas City. I want you to meet your team. I know you, you're, you're not here every day, but this is Chris. Uh, he's working on this, editing this thing for you. This is um, you know, Joe, this is what Joe's doing here. Anyway, we love you. Ho ho hopefully you'll get to Dallas soon and we'll get to meet you and then send. I mean, it's a very personal way to meet somebody. And I don't know how you feel, Jeff, about video resumes, but I, I think so much of uh, a job candidate is, do I, do I like them enough to bring them in for an interview? Do they seem like a cool person? Or it's hard to get enough uh, information from a written resume, I find. Um, like one of the persons, people on the call said, you can obviously go to LinkedIn and see what they look like. But even that, it's 
typically written so professionally that it gives you no feel for what this person is like. And I always said to myself, uh, I got to get to the point where they know, like, and trust me in order for them to buy from me. And so what more can I do to audition for them um, by showing me, and you know, you have already heard the story about me exploiting my daughter in, in, the, in the snow, that I, I'm convinced that those video resumes is what ended up getting me the job in, in um, Dallas. It wasn't the quality of my reporting, which I'm sure was fine, but they had a million uh, Jeff Krillies that they could have chosen from. So it was really the stick to that helped me get the job. And it was the, uh, the using video to tell my story. Anybody tell else? The story, tell the story about uh, the, the pizza. pizza. Yeah, okay, so, I love that. Um, I was in, um, so I, I fell in love with Victoria Snee and Victoria Snee for, for those of you who recognize that name was a reporter at channel 33 here in town. And she was also a, uh, let me actually, let's, since we do have AV, let me, let me, sh let me show you Victoria. Um, so Victoria gets a job in Wichita Falls. Um, and uh, when she got a job in Wichita Falls, have any, has anybody ever gone to Wichita Falls? It's a very small market and she is a young TV reporter in Wichita Falls. And when she's out reporting the news in Wichita Falls, uh, that's, that's what Victoria looks like. Um, I became kind of her cameraman. So I would, uh, my days off were Saturday, Sunday, her days off were uh, Tuesday, Wednesdays. And so what I would do is I would go, um, I'd go up to Wichita Falls and I would be her photographer. I'd take my baseball cap on, I'd flip it backwards and I would, I would be her photographer and um, helped her learn. There's Victoria on the left. Help her learn um, how to report. But I was sleep deprived. The commute was brutal, um, <laughs> and I was desperate to get out. I was desperate to get both of us out. And so I had read this book called Three Hundred and Three Offbeat Ways to Get a Job. You can probably still find it on Amazon. Um, but I'll save you some money because the the book was all about just kind of off the wall ways to get somebody's attention. And as I'm thumbing through this book to get her out of Wichita Falls, I came across this chapter that described the pizza trick. So the pizza trick, the pizza trick is you get a cheese pizza. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of money. It could be an $8 cheese or a $5 cheese from Little Caesars. You take your resume, you flip it upside down, you put it on top of the pizza box. So you have something to write on. And you say in big bold letters, hire me, I always deliver, pun intended. And then underneath that, I would say, uh, I know this is a cheesy way, I would underline cheesy, so they knew I, I got my own pun, a cheesy way to get your attention, but I would do anything for a job interview at uh, you know, Channel 33. So Victoria's reporting in Wichita Falls, I'm in Dallas, I'm on the air here, and I decided, you know, I'm gonna deliver this pizza to see how it works. So I um, showed up over the lunch hour uh, with this pizza and channel 33 was just going on the air with their, their newscast. And normally I loved to be recognized, but on this day I was praying that I was not gonna get recognized because whoever would recognize me would think to themselves, man, times must be hard at Fox 4 if they've got their reporters delivering pizzas over the lunch hour. But I delivered this pizza Pizza goes back to the news director, and this was before all of us had cell phones. Her pager goes off in the uh, Wichita Falls newsroom, and she calls the news director back, and his words were, okay, pizza girl, you got my attention. What are you doing tomorrow? She says, I'm driving to, I'm driving to Dallas to interview with you. <laughs> he says, good answer. We'll see you tomorrow. So she ended up um, getting the job at Channel 33, and... Um, worked her way up and, and now she's got the best gig ever. She, she went from television and radio to head of marketing for North Park Mall. She helped them celebrate 50 years in, uh, in existence. And then right about the time that, that she was kind of getting bored with North Park, Legacy West started up. And so she went from a 50 year old institution to dirt and she became the head of marketing for Legacy West. And once all those fancy uh, restaurants and stores had been built and she was starting to get bored, uh, along comes Highland Park Village calling. And so now she has the most glamorous job in the world. She works around luxury brands 
and she, it looks, you know, she feels like she died and went to heaven every day because she gets to promote, um, you know, the Chanel's and the Gucci's and uh, all of those, you know, high-end stores. Um, any any other questions? I'm thanks for reminding me to tell the pizza story, Jeff. That's one of my favorite. Yeah, I always, I always love that story. I think it's a great way, you know, to put your resume on the pizza, deliver it. This is a cheesy idea, but please read my resume. Uh, another one along the same lines is uh, uh, you put some cookies in a shoebox or something like that, and uh, you know you say uh, you know uh, there's no such thing as a crummy idea, or you know I hope this is not a crummy uh, just uh, puns. You can't you can never have too many puns. I I feel uh, put a shoe one shoe in a shoebox just trying to get my foot in the door. You've heard some of these things. <laughs> right. Right. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for your time. I don't want to keep you. I know it's just after 11 o'clock. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I've got a number of people in the chat have given me your email, given awesome. me their email address. So I will send that to you and then awesome. uh, let you forward your uh, copy of your book over to them. So thank Jeff, thank you very, very much. Okay. God bless. Thanks. Okay. All right. I uh, just want to remind everybody next week. Uh, we're going to talk about personal branding. Don Nabon will be with us. Uh, if you'd like to join me here at Christ United Methodist Church uh, to meet in person, you're welcome to do so next Friday. We'll see how that goes. We'll have a little bit of an audience here, and so you don't not looking at blank uh, chairs in the background as you are. If you see one of the cameras says "Park Camera," uh, you're welcome to come join us if you'd like to next Friday. We'll see how that goes. Uh, let's see here. If you have not put your 30 second reductions into the chat window, please do so. Give us your name, phone, email address, position you're looking for, two or three target companies. I will get that out to everybody this afternoon. Uh, also, if you want a copy of Jeff's ebook, uh, just uh, send me, you know, be sure to put your email address in there and tell me you want a copy of the book, and I will get those emails to him for him to send that to you uh, later today. So. Uh, all right. Uh, crew to be and crew USA, we're putting on training four days a week. Uh, next Tuesday, Kurt Von der Mater will be with us for LinkedIn Tuesdays to talk about LinkedIn recruiters from a recruit LinkedIn from a recruiter's eye. Next Wednesday, we already have a practice interview scheduled. I think all the all three slots are scheduled next week. So if you're uh, looking, we'll have a real practice interview you can watch. We had a great one this past uh, Wednesday, and we'll have another good one next Wednesday. Uh, this Thursday coming up is the fourth Thursday of the month, so we're going to talk about networking. Uh, this session has been recorded. It will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel. On the Career USA YouTube channel, click on playlist. Every video that I upload goes into a different uh, playlist, makes it easy for you to view. And then uh, don't click on the video, but down below where it says view for playlist, we see that red arrow. Click there. And then you can go back and you can scroll down and see whatever topic it is you'd like to go back and see. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, everybody. Have a great weekend. Uh, if a couple people want to hang on the line after we get done here, I'd like to figure out my audio issue so we can uh, make that work better next week. Uh, so I appreciate everybody being with us today. Have a great weekend. And uh, it's only supposed to be in the 80s on, on Sunday. So I don't know. It'll be like... We're living in a different city. So have a great weekend, everybody.